Hello and good morning, everyone. So happy to see everyone here. It's I'm super excited to um, about the topic we have this morning, and it all came about um, me hearing your stories and hearing you talk about the difficulties you're encountering, the challenging you're facing as new moms while you're trying to juggle motherhood and still have a career and the diff, the stumbling block blocks that you came across also financially. We have so many moms now where the rents have been raised 50%, where the, the husbands or partners are losing their jobs and we're all in a bit of a pickle, right? And we're trying to make ends meet. So we've decided to reach out to Frolic, which is a beautiful coaching practice. They have so many different disciplines and modalities, but they're all really, really focused on you mummies. And so today I'm welcoming Eva and Michelle, and they have their own areas of expertise that will be really relevant for this topic. And I'll go on by inviting you to introduce yourself and your practice. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you so much, uh, Johanna, and to everyone in the Bump Wise uh, community. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be here with you all today. And, um, and to really talk about topics that are so relevant, as Johanna has, has mentioned, so relevant to the current times and to also the stages that we are in our lives. So um, I'm going to get started and uh, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, myself and Michelle formally. I'm going to go and share my screen and allow you to also follow along. So let me... Just adjust my screen one second. Thank you so much. And yes, um, today's topic is all about thriving mom and unlocking personal and financial fulfillment. And we have partnered uh, with Bumpwise from the Frolic for Life family coaching practice. And our practice helps kids and parents gain the best out of life as family and individuals. Why is that? Because our collective team is comprised of parents, like we're mostly moms. And we believe in the power of coaching and giving families all they need to raise great kids, to live harmoniously and to frolic for life, hence the name. So as you can see from the next slide, we have quite a few uh, categories of coaching uh, that we address with our clients. Uh, we have health and wellness, fitness, relationships, um, parenting. And um, today we're going to be focusing on two main areas, which is uh, finance and life and career. So yours truly and Michelle Howell are going to be really your guides today during this uh, conversation in a very safe space where we as women can come together and really get down to the nitty gritty uh, down to the nitty gritty of what are those things that are really um, giving us resistance or making us feel like we are not gaining momentum into these two areas of our lives. And so let me introduce uh, Michelle first of all. So Michelle um, Howell is a financial advisor and financial wellness coach. And she has over 18 years of experience in the wealth management industry in Australia and Singapore, and is a certified financial planner. And with her holistic approach, Michelle provides tailor-made financial advice and solutions for her clients. And whether you need help with budgeting, saving, adjusting uh, money mindsets, or understanding the importance of building investment portfolios, or ensuring your family wealth is protected, her coaching and advice aims to empower individuals to create financial awareness, uh, wellness, and confidence. And as for me, I'm a resilience, um, an emotional resilience coach, and I'm also an RTT hypnotherapist. And I really specialize in helping women go from fine to falling in love with life, as in, pinch me, I can't believe this is my life. And my approach focuses on facilitating powerful transformations so that my clients can really enjoy success, connection, freedom, financial and time-wise, and profound fulfillment. Uh, 
And so I have been the recipient of the 2023 and 2024 CREA Global Awards for contributions in mental health. So welcome everybody and we can get started. So thank you, Eva. Yes. So I want to um, start off ladies today with a, uh, with a story that has resonated with me very deeply that you may not have heard in full. So perhaps you are familiar with the image that I'm sharing right now because during this year's Paris Olympics, Turkish uh, shooter Yusuf Dikage, I hope that I'm saying his name right, in a wrinkled t-shirt made headlines, earning the silver medal with his hand in his pocket. And he became an overnight sensation um, due to this. But what most people don't realize is that he didn't achieve this alone. So his teammate a, is a young woman named Seval Elaida Tarhan, and she played an equally pivotal role. But despite her incredible performance, she's been completely erased from the media spotlight. And I'm sorry, I don't know why the image is not loading, but um, I will share it very soon. And um, in the image, you can see how she's also, you know, wearing a very simple outfit, very minimal equipment with her hand in her pockets as well. And so this isn't just a sports story. This is a metaphor for how many of us feel as women, especially as mothers. To be considered good mothers, we have to take a mile long list of to-dos. But dads, on the other hand, they just seem to need to be able to push a stroller. And so our voices, contributions, and achievements often get sidelined. And because of this, our worth doesn't get fully acknowledged and we lose out on the financial rewards that we deserve. As mothers, we sometimes feel like we're constantly juggling between families, career, and everything in between. And in all that juggling, we put ourselves last, allowing our financial power to slip away because we are prioritizing everything else. But there's a deeper struggle going on. And that's really the, the nitty gritty of the conversation today. We are starting to question our worth along this journey. Am I enough? Can I really have it all? And all of that carries a stress, carries self-doubt, carries lack of confidence, and it silences us. We stop speaking up for what we want for fear of creating arguments with others or being misunderstood. But if you're here today, it's because you've answered a call. Every mother deserves to thrive personally and professionally without feeling torn between the two. This isn't just about having a paycheck or a title. It's about using your authentic voice to claim abundance and opportunities that are meant for you. So today I'm going to be sharing about the power of visibility and using your authentic voice to unlock money, wealth, and abundance in your life. And why is visibility important? Visibility leads to financial empowerment, plain and simple. When your voice isn't heard, your worth isn't acknowledged, and you lose out on the financial rewards that should come with it. This is why I do the work I do, because I vehemently believe in the following. More money in the hands of women is a blessing for the planet. It's not about working harder, but about letting your authentic voice be heard. So good morning, everyone. I'm Eva Perez, I as I just mentioned. And there's really, I mean, I know I read my bio, but more in this informal conversation that we're having, there's three things to really know about me. I'm a mother of two. Uh, I have an eight-year-old who's enjoying pre-puberty and a youngest who's six years old who thinks six is a good time to practice like her brother. I'm a matcha evangelist and I am borderline obsessed really with taking women from just fine to falling in love with life. My crusade is to debunk the myth that more effort and hustling 24 seven is the key to financial rewards. The real work lies in aligning your beliefs and your voice. It's not about being louder or talking more, it's about being more authentic and knowing how to speak to have real impact.
So here's what you will love learning about today. You're gonna learn about the formula for your financial power. There is a formula for that. You're going to learn how to access your genie in a bottle because we all have it. It's not made up fantasy from a Disney story and how to access the highest frequency on the planet. So let's start off with the formula for financial power, okay? We as women navigate between two worlds daily, constantly, all the time. The world out there and the world in here. The sobering truth is that out there, we're already at a disadvantage, especially when it comes to financial matters. Let's consider the following. We earn 22% less on every dollar than what a man makes. 72% of women feel intimidated by, by financial jargon, and they don't feel confident selecting investments on their own. 67% of women say they don't feel understood by their financial advisor. Well, that's probably because they don't have uh, the opportunity to work with Michelle yet, but it still stands. And in here, in the world in here, within ourselves, the challenges are no less complex. There's the ongoing negative inner dialogue, the what ifs, the outdated beliefs that no longer serve us, and perhaps even trauma that we've been holding on for far too long. So we've got these two worlds, but there's the thing to know, we only need to improve one to truly move ahead. And it's not the external world, it's the internal one. And here's the great news. The world in here is the fastest that we can improve as well, especially if you want to attract not just financial wealth, but more of the good that life has to offer. So you probably already knew this. And here is where I want to pass for a moment. And let's make this a little bit interactive. Please write in the chat if you agree or you disagree with the following statement. The way you think has an effect on your life. Do you agree or you disagree? So if you are mostly agreeing with the way you think has an effect on your life, how many of you actually woke up this morning and actually created your future. A future where you have access to financial rewards and all of the following. Infinite abundance, infinite possibilities, unlimited creativity, money, grace, and loving kindness, eternal love, boundless giving. All of the above plus the money is your birthright, ladies. So if you're not waking up and deliberately creating the future for yourself, it's possibly because a part of you doesn't fully, truly believe in it. It doesn't think that it's possible, perhaps. But the truth is, enjoying true impact, having the visibility you deserve, receiving more financial gain, it all starts in your mind, and more specifically, your subconscious mind, because your subconscious is 30,000 times more powerful than your conscious mind. As Bob Proctor used to say, if you can see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hands. This applies to wealth and money as well. But unfortunately, for the majority of us, we tend to go through our days seeing the same people that push the same emotional buttons, doing the exact same things, following the same routines day in and day out. And here's my question. How can we expect our brain to change at all? So the formula for your financial power is the following. Every thought creates a feeling which leads to an action that when you repeat it creates a behavior and that becomes your destiny, the end. When we feel that we're not making progress, when the financial recognitions that we deserve aren't coming, when the doors aren't opening, when we feel stuck or confused, it's important to understand that the formula is already working. And all we need to do is to reverse directions. So how do we do that? We give power to the thoughts that we truly want. Think about this. On average, we have about 60,000 thoughts in our day. Of these thousands of thoughts, 80% are mostly negative and 95% are exactly the same repetitive thoughts as the day before. So cue in your genie in a bottle 
and how you're going to make it work in your favor. Because I want to share something fascinating with you in neuroscience. There is a part of the brain called the reticular activating system, or RAS for short. And it acts as a filter, which determines what you focus on and what opportunities you see. If you had to consciously digest and be aware of the billions and billions of bits of data that we're exposed to on any given day, we would self-combust. So that's why the RAS comes into play, and it's something that we all have. So the RAS determines what to focus on based on four things and four things only. Any danger or any signs of threats, your name being called out, even, even if there's two of you in a crowd, you will turn around and you will look for whoever is calling you out. Any um, reproductive signals or sexual signals from prospective partners and anything that you tell your RAS that it's important to you. So if your RAS is on autopilot, focused on the same negative and repetitive thoughts, it will continue to focus and expand more on that. Because our RAS is not like a loving mother. When our children are sick, we try to make them feel better. We make them soup, we give them their favorite toys to play with, we cuddle with them. But the RAS gives us more of what we are already focusing on via strong feelings. So consider this statistic, 61% of us women would rather talk about death than money. So if we're in that 61%, our RAS is processing that money is more painful than death. And so it will steer you away from it as much as possible. This is also belief in action. So is it any wonder then that many of us feel disconnected from our financial power? Much like Seval Elaida Tarhan's story, we're often kept out of the conversations that lead to true financial freedom and abundance. And moreover, the thoughts that our RAS will deem important come from our beliefs. So this is key. Because since the RAS is connected to our beliefs, which reside in our subconscious, when you align your RAS with empowering beliefs, you can begin to shift your experience. So if what we want to experience is more wealth, more financial gains, more money, the objective is to learn how to harmonize your RAS with new empowering beliefs. Because your ability to do this will determine how you see money, how you gain it, and how you use it for. Because the RAS will act upon those beliefs. As I tell my clients, life in life, you don't get what you want, you get what you believe in. Remember that the RAS takes all the information you're exposed to daily and decides what to pay attention to. For example, if you've decided to buy a certain car, you might suddenly start seeing that car everywhere. That's your RAS at work. It helps you to spot the opportunities or patterns that match what you're focusing on. So when you train your RAS to look for positive outcomes, like financial opportunities or ways to use your voice effectively, you can shift your attention and energy towards achieving those goals. So now I want us to do a very quick exercise. All you need to do is type in the chat or in a piece of paper if you're catching the replay. I'm going to show you here 10 values and I need you to rate the top one for you. And hint, there's no right or wrong answer. There's freedom, intimacy, success, love, health, security, adventure, power, passion, and comfort. Choose the one that is number one for you right now. You cannot get it wrong. And choose the one that really fully resonates with you at the moment. Okay, now we have a new cluster. And these are eight emotions that we all tend to avoid. Like we want to avoid all of them, but there's one that we tend to avoid more. Choose which one that is for you. In no particular order, there's guilt, loneliness, frustration, humiliation, failure, anger, rejection, and depression.
Okay. Now, take a look at your number one pick for your value and your number one pick for the emotion that you most want to avoid. If you chose success, for example, and rejection, can you see how your wanting to avoid rejection is creating interference with your path to success? But more importantly, rejection likely has a stronger feeling or emotion attached in your life, which activates your RAS to look for more situations where you feel echo of this. So if you have multiple situations where you've experienced rejection, it becomes part of a belief, a very deeply rooted one. That is why it's so important that our voice, it's aligned with our true values and desires, because this is the way that it really carries the most impact. It's not just about speaking, it's about speaking from a place or truth, which naturally attracts the right opportunities and financial gains. So we limit who we really are by the beliefs we unconsciously agree to live by. I will say that again, we limit who we really are by the beliefs we unconsciously agree to live by. Does anybody know what a Faraday cage is by any chance? So a Faraday cage is a place that is devoid of any frequency. There's no microwave, there's no Wi-Fi, there's no 5G. There is absolutely no type of frequencies in there. And humans can be in a Faraday cage possibly up to about a couple of minutes at a time. So they have placed human beings in a Faraday cage and they have measured what is the highest frequency that a human can emit. That's why it's devoid of any frequencies because we just want to know what we are emitting ourselves. And do you know what that frequency is? The highest human uh, frequency that we can emit is the frequency of authenticity. And this is because authenticity means aligning what you say with what you truly believe. In a nutshell is saying what you believe and believing what you say. It has to be, it has to be super aligned. And this is a powerful resonance that people naturally respond to. That's why as women, when it comes to claiming our financial power, we must tap into this frequency. We cannot achieve true financial abundance without using our authentic voice, one that reflects who we are and what we stand for. So by speaking our truth confidently, we create alignment. And with that alignment comes the ability to attract financial compensation and opportunities we desire because we're voicing them. As women, we are left on the sidelines, much like Seval Tarhan, and we remain in the shadows, unseen and unheard, trying to play nice, trying to be the nice girls, trying to keep everyone happy. But just like she played a pivotal role in Turkey winning the silver medal, each one of you has the potential to achieve remarkable things if you harness your authentic voice. And that's why I'm so passionate to help empower self-led women like you to enjoy more financial impact by leveraging the power of your voice. And the best part is that you don't have to hustle 24 seven. It's about using your personally aligned human design throat center your beliefs and your RAS to work smarter and not harder. I know that some of you may feel that this is too good to be true, or maybe you've tried other methods before without success. But the truth is, if you continue to let your RAS go on autopilot, you remain in the same place. So I'm here to show you a proven path that aligns with who you truly are. And for those of you who are ready to take the next step, and only for those Beautiful ladies here in the Bombay's community, I invite you to get onto the exclusive pre-sale opportunity to truly harmonize your voice, your beliefs, and your RAS. This is a perfect opportunity to step into your power and claim your financial rewards. I've helped women go from fine to falling in love with their lives, and I know that that's a possibility for you too. The transformation starts with you stepping into your truth and using your voice to claim the financial impact you deserve. And like Seval, who was standing beside a global sensation but remain unseen, 
It's time truly for all of us to stop hiding and to claim our space. The power is already inside of each one of us and it starts with speaking, with using our voice. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm so glad to have shared this with you today. And now I'm passing on the mic to Michelle. Thank you, Eva. That was a good reminder for all of us to step out of, our, out of the shadow and claim our, our place in the spotlight. <laughs> so I'm really uh, keen now to learn from Michelle because I definitely know that I'm not taking charge of finances necessary. It's always a man's job, right? <laughs> well, I'm here to uh, just to debunk that, that myth. So let me just share my screen. Um, just give sure, me I'll a stop minute. Sharing my... Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Michelle Howell. And uh, let me just adjust my screen settings. Okay. So um, thank you so much, Eva. Much of what um, Eva has covered, I will be echoing and mirroring because um, a lot of the discussions about core values and um, the very interesting statistics around 61% of women would rather talk about death than money. Um, I'm here to hopefully start to uh, decrease that number and to really um, encourage women to talk about money openly, um, you know, with each other, with their family, with their partners. It really isn't that scary. So um, let me start by just um, uh, with a bit of a... Um, a an introduction of, about who I am. So in my journey in life, uh, I'm currently a mother of a 13 year old and an 11 year old boy. Uh, and I'm a financial advisor and coach. However, I've also been a stay at home mum and a trailing spouse. And so, so I believe the important role that we play in our family as mothers can also come with very complex feelings of self doubt uh, from a change in identity uh, and responsibilities. And the idea of taking control of family finances can seem daunting at first. However, I invite you to think of it as taking on an invaluable life skill uh, that can set you and your family up for your happiness and success in life. So what is financial wellness? Um, so financial wellness is the state of living in which your well-being is measured by the quality of your life, not just your wealth. And how do you know whether you're financially well? So with the physical and lifestyle changes that come along with being a mother, there is more focus on wellness. But there's a component of wellness that is commonly overlooked, uh, but is hugely important and that is financial wellness. So what exactly is it and how do you know whether you're financially well? So here are five key indicators that you've achieved a, sta a state of financial wellness. So the first is that you're prepared for emergencies. So ideally what you'll want is an emergency fund that can cover at least three to six months of your li living expenses. The second is that your spending habits support your values. So Eva mentioned about identifying those core values. So those things that you wrote down in the chat, there were things like health, security, success, freedom. So do your spending habits actually support those things that are important to you? Every dollar you spend should get you closer to the person that you want to be and what is important to you. And to do this, you need a budget that is designed around your personal values and your goals. Uh, and a spending analysis is a great first step to identify the types of spending that adds to your life in a positive way or what is causing you guilt, stress or negative feelings. The third um, point is that you feel in control and confident about your decisions. So when people say, I'm not good with money, it usually just means they haven't had the time or the opportunity to develop their personal finance skills. Successful money management is like riding a bike. So the key to feeling confident is learning what you need to do and then practicing it until you get it right. The fourth one is that you are staying on track toward your future goals. So identifying clear, concrete goals that inspire you is a critical step in your financial wellness journey. So write down what you want to achieve, when you'll need the money and how much you'll need. 
and then save and invest toward these goals and track your progress on a regular basis. And finally, um, the fifth sign is that you're free of financial stress. So money is the number one cause of stress for most adults, but it doesn't have to be. You can choose to master your money instead. And financial stress stems from a lot of different things. Um, so yours might be eliminated when you're free of debt, uh, you have a safety net for your loved ones, or you've got a financial plan that aligns who you are and what you value. Stay-at-home mothers or working mothers who have taken a step down in salary for more flexibility tend to encounter financial stress due to reduced income and may feel isolated and undervalued, impacting mental and social well-being. And I noticed that in the chat there were a few, um, uh, you know, sort of feelings of loneliness, um, of um, frustration, rejection. So all of those sorts of feelings can impact on the way that you um, also feel about your financial wellness also. So before we jump into practical strategies on, on how to gain better money management skills and more financial literacy, let's take a step back and think about the psychology of money as this can be the very first blocker to achieving financial wellness. So I want to talk a little bit about your money mindset. Uh, and your money mindset is a collection of your beliefs, perceptions, and attitudes towards money. And no one is entirely rational when it comes to money. So we know we need a financial plan, but put off the work involved and somehow it never happens. Uh, we may spend too much out of recklessness or maybe too little out of guilt. So how do you feel about money? And what are the first words that come to mind? And I'd like you to either, you know, quickly scribble down a few words or put them in the chat. What are the first words that come to mind uh, when you think about money? I'll try and pull up my chat so I can see. Sorry, I can't, um, I can't see the words. Oh, here we go. Stress. Okay, great. Wealth, freedom, sustenance, financial freedom, stress, options. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And so in terms of the negative words, so often when I ask this question, um, anxiety and fear, are often at the top of the list of negative emotions. So maybe you worry about how you'll earn enough of it um, and how you'll pay your bills or meet school fees, uh, or perhaps that you'll lose what you have or that you can't manage what you have well enough. Um, anger and regret are the shoulda, woulda, coulda emotions. Uh, so maybe you're angry with yourself for going on a shopping binge or perhaps not saving enough money. Uh, or maybe you have regrets about having too much debt, or perhaps you're mad at the world for your situation. For example, your career taking a back seat to a family, which may result in lower or no pay. Shame and embarrassment are all too common emotions when it comes to money. So maybe you feel uh, shame because you feel people judge you for your money mistakes or spending habits, or you may feel embarrassed that you don't understand financial concepts or feel silly asking questions for fear of sounding stupid. So all of this is very common and there is absolutely no ju judgment as to how you feel about money. So some of the positive feelings that you may have towards money, um, confidence, so understanding money and what you can do with it. For example, investing can make you feel confident. Motivation, so being inspired by money, it can motivate you. It can help you create joy and opportunities. For example, the ability to shout friends and family out for a nice meal, perhaps um, supporting your parents financially, uh, going on a holiday or giving back to charity. And freedom, which was one of the words um, that was included in the chat. Imagine being in a situation where you can make your life decisions, not based on whether you can afford it, but because you actually want to do it. So as with other general beliefs, perceptions and attitudes, 
much of this is influenced by your childhood, uh, your cultural background and your life experiences. And everyone has a money blueprint. And this is what feeds into your current money mindset. Now, much of your money mindset is a product of your own self-beliefs, uh, your childhood and family dynamics, your life experiences and your current relationships. For example, do you believe you are good or bad with money? Did your father or your mother predominantly handle the finances in your family growing up? Uh, and how do your friends and the people you surround yourself with handle money? Uh, and lastly, do you have equal responsibility for family finances with your partner or does one take more control over the other? So it's important to note that there is no right or wrong answer to any of these questions. And it's a matter of identifying your personal money blueprint and working with it. So it's worth thinking of money as something with which you have a complex relationship with. So you make decisions that impact your financial situation and then these in turn affect your feelings and future behaviours. So it's a relationship that evolves over time. And it is also important to note that money mindsets can be changed. All right, so you've probably heard of Stephen Covey. So Stephen Covey initially coined these terms, an abundance and a scarcity mindset, uh, in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which you've probably heard of. So people with an abundance mindset, they often have a successful way of thinking. They reflect on events and life in an optimistic way. Um, they see opportunities and limitless possibilities. And they look at life through a lens of gratitude. So in contrast, people with a scarcity mindset uh, often see life as having only so much, for example, money, success. And if somebody succeeds, then another must lose. Uh, the mindset is around comparison, competition, jealousy, and limited possibilities. And it comes from a place of fear. So how can we make the shift from a scarcity to an abundance mindset? So there are some, I've got five tips here. So of some ways to go from an, a scarcity to an abundance mindset. So the first is to practice gratefulness. If you look at what you have in life, you'll always have more. However, if you look at what you don't have in life, you'll never have enough. Uh, so the second tip is to surround yourself with people who have an abundance mindset. So seek out friends who have a positive attitude to money and to life. The third is to create win-win situations. So perhaps planned experiences with inclusiveness in mind, for example, dinner out with friends within a budget challenge. Um, the fourth is to ban the words, I can't afford it. So don't put the don't haves up front. You are in control with where your money goes. And the fifth, recognize possibilities. So open your mind to other possibilities. For example, investments. Okay, so let's talk about the values that we touched on earlier in the session and how they fit with your current spending habits. So money needs clarity. Ask yourself, what do you want from your money? And what do you want from life? So money really is a tool to help us achieve a goal, not an end in itself. So if the way that we handle our money conflicts with our personal values, it is harder to live a happy and fulfilling life. Now, I invite you to take some time after the webinar to note down the main expenses in your family budget. Can you match your expenditure to your core values? So for example, Someone had written down security um, as, as something that's important to them. So if you look at your family expenditure, do you actually spend on, on, on something um, in your family budget that actually addresses your need for security, which would be, for example, making sure that your family is properly uh, covered um, for, you know, in event of something, a critical illness happening to you or your, your partner um, in terms of death, uh, in terms of savings. So do you have plans in place that address that need for security? Uh, so, and if they don't match, then have a think about how you can make some adjustments to align your core values um, with your spending habits. Okay, so um, the next uh, 
uh, information I'd like to share with you um, is to, to encourage you to be the CFO of your family, which is the most important entity. And the first thing I'd like to say is that a man is not a plan. So you may be dependent on your partner's income, whether permanently or temporarily, but that doesn't mean you should sit back and let him take care of all things financial. So one of the three dreaded Ds, death, disease, and divorce, could very well leave you without your currently reliable man, which will mean you having to take the financial reins. And how would you manage? So the first question to ask yourself is, do you understand how the household finances work? So I've seen situations where the partner who is solely responsible for all things financial in a household passes away, leaving the other completely at sea. And that is a really scary position to be in and one which is entirely avoidable. So make sure you have a grasp of your family income and outgoings from either rent or mortgage and regular bill payments to school fees and general expenditure. You should also know exactly what assets you and your partner own, including bank accounts, investments and property. Knowledge is power, so arm yourself to the max. The second question to ask yourself is, do you have independent savings? Statistically, women are likely to outlive their male partners. And it is important to have an open discussion with your partner to work out a financial plan together, which includes independent savings for you. So, and, and so number three, does your partner have life insurance? So this is not a pleasant thought, but do you as a couple have life insurance in place to protect you and your family if your partner dies and there was no longer that income coming into the household? A failure to put adequate cover in place could find you either having to um, find work urgently or change your lifestyle considerably or both. And a good financial advisor can help you work out what level of cover you need, uh, taking into account your current financial obligations. Other wealth protection measures such as critical illness cover, for example, um, cancer, stroke, heart attack, may also be worth consideration. And the, the final question to ask yourself is, is your estate planning sorted? So estate planning can be complicated by cross-border issues, especially if you and your partner are, are of different nationalities or if um, certain assets are located in different countries, which could be very common for in the expat community. So it is worth seeking advice to ensure that should one of you pass away, assets are distributed as you wish them to be. So now that we've explored your our money mindset, connecting our spending habits to our core values and the importance of being the CFO of your family, let's look at practical tips on how we achieve our financial goals. So goals can be written down into um, short-term, medium-term and long-term goals. And when we think about the amount needed for retirement being a long-term goal, this can be daunting and it's hard to know where to start. So let's start by focusing on the short-term financial goals first. And as you meet these goals, you naturally move up the pyramid to eventually achieve your long-term goals. So for example, uh, a short-term goal uh, could be monthly budgeting, paying off debt, making monthly contributions to an investment plan, uh, or making monthly contributions to insurance plan. Uh, Medium-term goals can be um, maxing out tax advantage investments. So for example, you know, if you're a, a Singaporean citizen or PR, you've got CPF. If not, then you've got other retirement plans, you've got offshore investment savings bonds, um, and perhaps looking at reducing expenses by 20%. And eventually, as you meet your short-term and your medium-term goals, you will move closer to achieving your long-term goals, which may be financial independence, you can retire without debt, um, and perhaps retire with a passive income stream. So first of all, start with having a conversation with your partner and seek help from a qualified advisor to help you put in place plans um, to achieve what is important to you and your family. And as part of the process um, of uh, mapping out your financial goals, which should involve having a, a savings investment and protection plan, um, you should, um, uh, a good financial advisor 
um, should also bring you along on the journey so that you build up your financial literacy knowledge. For example, on the types of investments available in the market and which ones would best suit your needs. So this will arm you with the knowledge and confidence to be the CFO of your family. So um, I hope that we've provided you with some food for thought today um, and we invite you to take the next steps. So to start a conversation about how you would like to achieve your personal and financial fulfillment. Um, and please feel free to reach out to Eva and myself um, for a free discovery call to see how we can support you and your family. So I think we've got just enough time we've got, um, for some Q&A. Um, so Johanna, I'll, um, I'll stop sharing my screen and hand over the reins to you. Yeah, great. Happy that so many mummies could join us. Uh, as you were speaking, I got lots of requests to share the recording later as well. So this is clearly, we've hit the spot. Um, lots of people are interested in this. Um, I have one first question and uh, anyone on the call, please put your questions in the chat. You can also let us know if you'd like to just unmute yourself and speak to those two lovely ladies. First question is for Michelle. The role of CFO in our family is currently managed by my husband who has experience in finance. What would you propose that I do to take ownership of this without offending him, without having a conflict with him? And actually, how do you manage different um, values? Because, you know, having uh, your, my partner might have a completely different idea of his financial values than mine. They might not necessarily match. So uh, what is your recommendation here? OK, so first of all, that is a great question. And uh, Charmaine, I'm in exactly the same situation, can you believe? So even though I'm a financial advisor and financial coach, my husband is a CFO of a multinational company. So, you know, even with me in my role, even I feel intimidated talking about finances with my husband. However, so family finances is can be very different to someone who is working in high finance. In So do not feel intimidated, even though they may have um, you know, the um, financial markets experience, et cetera, they might not know which particular, um, you know, insurance product is right for your family or which particular um, investment portfolio would be the right um, fit for your particular financial needs for your family. So don't make the assumption that because they have a financial background that they have all the answers. And I think that's where we can get very intimidated by, um, you know, partners who, who are in the in that industry. Um, and also taking an interest in the family finances doesn't mean that you have, it doesn't mean that whoever has the most knowledge takes the reins. It's also, um, you know, who has the relationship with someone trusted that you have a communication channels to speak to someone about, okay, this is uh, a change in our life circumstances. We are due to have another baby or we are due to um, send our kids off to tertiary education to pay for university. So we need to put some money aside for that. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the person with the most knowledge um, should reach out and have that discussion with, um, with an advisor or a coach. So it's, it's often the women actually who are better at forming relationships and better at forming rapport with people, it's up to you to find someone that you feel comfortable with to start those conversations. And really, you're not then expected to know, okay, I want to invest in this particular asset. That's that's something that you discuss with a um, qualified professional. Um, your job in that relationship and in that role is to identify your values, to align your values with your partner, and then to find a professional to then help you achieve what you want. So you don't need to have that that financial knowledge. The financial literacy piece is to help you build your own confidence and you should find someone that to work with that you feel comfortable with to ask those questions to build your confidence. Um, your question about if your um, values are not aligned, that is a, a really good question as well. And it, it, it's the same as with anything. So it's about your values around um, parenting, your values around healthy eating, about around exercise, about how you have your relationship. So not everyone can be perfectly aligned. And that's what a relationship is. It's about identifying your similarities and your differences and having that all open and uh, on the table and then finding strategies about how you then uh, work with your differences and how you might align them. So, um, 
and and it's not a, a you know say for example if your goal is to um you know you don't necessarily want to pass all your money down to your children you want to have a you know you want to spend it in your lifetime and you prefer your children to make make their own way but your partner wants to scrimp and save and pass everything down as an inheritance to the children so you might have a middle ground so it's all about open communication and and working through um an agreed strategy with your yeah. your your same and different core values thank you for that i would also add that it is never a bad idea to think about the unthinkable because i was in a situation like five six years ago where i nearly lost my husband and i was sort of really struggling to figure out what does what would that mean if he died would i have access to his bank accounts or our joint bank accounts because things like that get frozen when uh, until the estate is settled and things like that so it's not a bad idea to, and it's definitely not confronting to have this discussion of what would happen in an emergency and just explaining to your partner that you need to have, you know, all this information that me, he needs to list that out for you for the sake of yourself and your children. So I think it's definitely a really important discussion to have because you never know when it will happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, a question in the chat is any websites or books that you can recommend to help build our financial knowledge? What is something that is easy to grasp? Because obviously there's a lot of information out there, but if you're starting from scratch and you haven't got any financial background, it's often difficult to juggle all these terms and the jargon and so on. What would your recommendation be there? Yeah, what is I can do, I can uh, send a link actually. So what, um, I'll provide you with some links to websites and books, the recommended books, and then uh, perhaps uh, Joanna, you could share with um, uh, with everyone, with our friends at Bumpwires here. Yeah, absolutely. That would be great. And especially when, when it goes into the territory of training spouses, because I do think that's a very different situation where, you know, we've given up, up um, our jobs and we're suddenly on a, it's so hard for us to set up our own business as well. So any um, recommendations for that too? Someone is asking slides, please. So is there any chance that we can share some of your, because they're good prompts for a discussion with our partners, I think, you know, what we need to think about to reach that financial savvy, that financial security as well. Yes, we can share these slides that um, we use today. Definitely, we'll send you the link, uh, a PDF. Okay, that sounds great. We have seven more minutes. I've got a question here. Beautifully put. I fully agree. I loved that. A man is not a plan. That is, I think that is my my favorite thing. <laughs> um, beautiful. I fully agree with all you've said, Michelle. I think what may be meaningful for myself would be financial self-sufficiency and independence along with the family goals. And she will book a discovery call within to speak with, with you to speak further. I think this is so important. We all need to take control, I think, of, of our finances, of everything in our lives as well. I mean, it's great to share responsibilities, right? I definitely encourage you. We don't have to carry all the load, but to be savvy and to be able to, I don't know, um, reset the Wi-Fi. <laughs> find the passwords for that. I mean, some very simple life hacks uh, are definitely needed. Mummies, any more questions? I know some of you have joined later in the call, so maybe you missed uh, what Eva was talking about as well, which was so empowering too about, you know, stepping out of the shadow and reclaiming your voice um, and not just being, you know, in, in the background and thinking you don't have the right to ask for fulfillment. I think... Um, is a really important one too. Um, so I encourage you to watch the recording later. Do we have any more questions, even speaking directly to Eva or Michelle? Um, I'll I'm just going back in the chat as well to see if there was anything else. There's one message now. How would you advise women who are considering a break post-birth? That's an excellent one. Taking time to be a mom, taking time to take care of our children and really fulfilling ourselves in the role of a mother. Um, anything that a mom can do who's now pregnant and planning ahead for the year after the baby is born and even longer term? 
So um, just to clarify a little bit more in the question, is it how can you approach the time that you are not going to be actively working, let's say, and how to uh, how to have some tools to help you navigate that better? Or is it to prepare to going back to enter the financial, uh, I'm sorry, the corporate world or... She says, yes, what to consider and plan for it. Okay. So I think that, um, you know, Michelle can can uh, take care a little bit more of the uh, practical aspects in terms of anything specific with the finances themselves. Um, one of the things that I would, that I would share in that scenario where you're finding that there is going to be a huge transition coming up is to, um, is to really revise. And I know that this sounds a little bit like eat your vegetables and, and sleep well and do exercise and, 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 it, and it's, it doesn't stop the scroll. And, and I know that it has been overused, but bear with me for a second, because going back to basics in, in a new phase of life is, is definitely a reset. And the reason why I say that is because when we are adults, we have all this um, experience under our belts, but, it, but those are experiences that apply to, to certain specific situations. And then when our lives enter a new season or a new stage, when there's a new member of the family about to arrive, it, it definitely changes the dynamics, even though there are there might be possibly children already in the mix, or if this is the first time having, having a baby, um, there will be a transition of adaptation that everybody has to go through. And in that transition, it's very important to give ourselves grace and space so that we can really assess where we are and what we resonate with in that moment. That is uh, the whole aspect of being authentic to ourselves and to really voice what our our concerns and what are our desires with the new chapter that is coming in front of us. So that reset, what does that look like? It looks like taking inventory of, you know, really what are my values in this new stage in life? I This is your permission slip to really, really, really understand that values is not something that you embrace once and those are your values for the rest of your life or that those were the values that you were instilled uh, by your parents or your family members, because those change. They, 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 they change according to the period and stage in your life that you're in. And, and it is very, uh, uh, very important to revise them every so often. Sometimes, you know, I use the uh, analogy of we all have phones. We all have this little, you know, device in our hands at all times. And when it tells us there's a, there's a software upgrade, there's a system upgrade, we just click on the button and we upgrade it. Why? Because we know that if we don't, the phone is going to glitch. We're going to crash. There's going to be viruses, bugs, whatever. It's not going to go as fast as we want it to go and so forth. So resetting that internal system for ourselves is also very, very relevant to do, especially in new transitions. So take a moment to pause and reflect and say, in this period that is coming up for me right now, what is going to be most important and 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 understand that um, there are seasons of life as as women um just because um you know using nature as reference just because a tree has absolutely no leaves because it's the middle of winter it doesn't mean that there is rebirth and growth coming up in the next season it's just a pause it's a it's a stage that we need to go through in order to be completely ready for the next one. And so society uh, sometimes keep us in this uh, hustling, grinding, uh, repeat cycle 24 seven. We have to be up to speed. We have to hit the ground running. We want to do things yesterday and, and we get into the speed that is that is not the speed at which our spirit, our mind, our beliefs, uh, our life needs it to be at that moment. So lots of grace. Definitely lots of space as well to contemplate, to ponder, to see what is truly important. What's this new iteration of you in this new stage of life? And then uh, aligning your beliefs and your RAS with the knowing that you've got this. Whatever comes your way in real time, you're going to be able to tackle it from the most highest self-empowered way when you take that stance, when you take that power back. But if we are feeling like we're always behind, 
that is more what we're going to be getting out of, you know, moving forward. So uh, that's a little bit from 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 my my take on on your question. And then I'm sure Michelle has other more practical um, uh, aspects to to add to the equation. Yes, I guess in terms of uh, rejoining a career. Um, uh, Personally, I actually, while on maternity break, um, I actually sort of had a bit of a, a career shift and I decided to move from, I think from the outside, doesn't sound very different from, a, from becoming a tax advisor to a financial advisor, it's still in the financial services space. But to me, it was a big shift in terms of um, how I work with, uh, the, uh, with people. So moving from a corporate advisory to individual, which is where I uh, I found I had that time to think about my purpose and what I wanted to achieve and aligning my my values. So, um, so I think I really took that time to to think about what I wanted to go into career wise. Um, from a from a financial perspective, I guess um, I mean there is a, you know having an open conversation about um, you know with your partner around um, taking a career break, what that means in terms of reduced income, how you then work through the family finances. So starting again with, um, open communication, um, and then, you know, working through your family budget, some adjustments that might need to be made, um, and then giving yourself a time to say, okay, well, during this time, we might have reduced income thereafter. This is my expected, depending on, you know, on what you decide to, um, uh, how you decide to rejoin, um, so all of that sort of just, yeah, it starts with open communication. Mm -hmm. I will add to that as well. Um, starting the conversation at work early, you know, seeing if you can have allies and how to set yourself up when you return from work, uh, when you return to work after a break, how you can juggle, how can you get more time? Can I work part-time? Can I work from home? You know, all of these things start these discussions with HR because I think HR needs to be more accommodating to us women. Uh, it is so often just geared towards and we're put put on, on the back, sh uh, back seat kind of thing of we're not important anymore. You know, we have a child, like Susanna was saying earlier, you know, she, they weren't, weren't even expecting her to come back after having twins. Why not? I like, like we have these rights and the workplace needs to be more accommodating and we need, we need to speak up, I think. One question was, the practical question, financial wellness um, walks hand in hand with the impeccable organization. <laughs> That's very true. So what is the best uh, place to store all that information and use as a point of reference as a couple and keep updated? Is it a shared spreadsheet or Google Docs? Or do you have other clever ideas? Or there might be an app for that. There's an app for everything, right? No, I agree. So but the good news is, is that, yes, it does require some good organizational skills. However, um, it is often as soon as you tackle the task and then you have everything laid out, then it's much easier going forward. It's always that first hurdle to get it started. But once you actually have everything. So what I would re recommend practically is I speak to my clients about having a legacy draw. So, um, you know, so think of it as you've got a drawer in your desk, you've got all the, the papers that you need. So you've got the, you know, your bank statement, your life insurance policy, you've got things that um, if anything were to happen to you or your partner, then somebody knows where to go to access the things that they need to, you know, take care of the financial matters if you're not around. Um, so, and that might look like a, um, uh, yes, you can use a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, a Google Doc. Um, I would recommend password protecting it. So just create, you know, um, an Excel spreadsheet, list down uh, your uh, bank accounts, the bank account numbers. Um, ideally, if you can, um, as, as particularly as um, expat spouses, um, the, if the accounts are set up as a joint account, then you both have access to the account. So if something happens to your partner, being a joint account holder, um, you can still have access. So it's, it's not frozen in the case that something happens. Whereas if it is, um, you know, if it's just under the, the name of your spouse and something happens to him, then and it's frozen, you don't have access to that account. So that's just something off. Off, I've got a little bit of a tangent there, but um, so in your spreadsheet, just put pop down um, your bank accounts, your um, your life insurance policies, your uh, any assets that you may have, so properties, um, uh, investment portfolios, you know the estimated values, password protected. So if um, 
you know, something happens to your computer, then no one can get access to that document because it will have some, you know, some specific information in there. Um, so that you've got a, a one-stop shop to go to um, where you've got a summary of your financial position. So if you do have a relationship with a financial advisor, then this should then be updated on a regular basis. Um, but if you're managing it yourself, then, you know, just every now and then, you know, once um, uh, once a year or so, just, just have a look at it, update the numbers. Um, if you've got a new um, account somewhere, you can just update that as well. So, um, so it really just, it only takes about half an hour to do um, and it's all in one place. So that's what I would recommend. Um, and then you're on the same page. You both know where to go. There is an agreed document. Um, so I would so use that as a starting point. Amazing. Great advice. We've gone a little bit over time. I apologize. But I am super happy for so many moms to have joined us. I am eternally grateful to Eva and Michelle. You've shared a lot of your extensive knowledge and I think it was very succinct and I really could relate to a lot of that. And I've been making notes all the time and I'm sure our moms did the same. So thank you very much for spending your time with us this morning. And uh, please send me all the information that we talked about, the list of books and references and websites, uh, but also the PDF of the presentation. And then I can share that with mummies uh, who are interested. Let us know, even if you're watching the recording later, please drop me a DM and I will share this with you. Thank you so much. And I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. Bye. Thank you, so Thank you for having us. Bye. Thank you.